Hello and welcome to the British Chamber of Commerce Singapore's podcast channel. With over 15,000 downloads since launch, we are excited to bring you season four featuring in-depth content on business, global affairs and news across Singapore, ASEAN and the United Kingdom. Thank you as always for your continued support and I hope you enjoy this podcast. Hello and welcome to a new episode in the Journey to Sustainable Finance series for Britcham Singapore. I'm Kate Weeble, a member of Britcham Sustainability Committee. I work at Barclays where among other roles I chair the Singapore Environment Network. With me today is Managing Director of the Asia Pacific Network for the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, or GFANS for short, uh, Yuki Yasui. Uh, Yuki will be talking about her journey into sustainable finance, her perspective on the outcomes of the latest COP in Dubai, her sustainable finance has changed during her career, and the areas she believes are key for governments and multinationals to be prioritising now. Yuki, great to have you with us. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Really pleasure to be joining you on this podcast. So I'm going to dive right in with my first question. What drew you to the world of sustainable finance? Was there a specific moment when you knew that the role of finance was essential in transforming our global systems to create a sustainable future? Yeah, so um, I joined sustainable finance quite early on. So I I started my career at in sustainable finance from UNEP Finance Initiative. So it's the United Nations Environment Programs Finance Initiative. Um, UNEP FI is one of the oldest voluntary initiatives on sustainable finance, and it actually started in 1992. So I joined 10 years after it was formed, but it was at the time it was like super, uh, still, still very a niche topic that only a few uh, CSR people within um, big financial institutions were involved in. So um, at the beginning, it was very much a very niche topic. The reason I joined, I started to really um, think about sustainable finance as a career was back in my first job after uni, university, I uh, was at a I was a trainee chartered accountant and I qualified under the ICAW, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. And when people qualify, um, they start to think about whether they stay in the industry or go into other fields of, um, of, of business and others. And I thought that it would be really nice if I could use my chartered accountant skills in sustainable development, because that was an area that I started to really get interested from my high school days. And so I went back to university to do a master's on environmental change and management, and then stumbled across a report from UNEP FI on sustainable finance. And I thought that was a really nice way of um, combining my accountancy skills with uh, sustainable development. So that's how I started my career, but the landscape of sustainable finance has been evolving so much that maybe I can just talk a little bit about how it has really changed over the 20 plus years that I've been involved. Um, so when I started, it was very much a kind of a corporate social responsibility, a CSR or compliance or maybe a, like a reputational risk area. And um, I think in those days, like Equator Principles was launched in 2003, where like banks were voluntarily following the IFC guidelines on doing no harm on like, you know, big project financing. And it was around the time when people started to understand that financial institutions had an impact on the environment and on local communities through its financing of businesses that may do harm. So the idea was to kind of, you know, make sure that financial institutions are responsible in not financing anything that is um, like doing a lot of harm to the environment. So that that kind of trend, you know, that that was how like sustainable finance was working. But then 
think it kind of started to change around 2005, 2006, where we started to understand that actually the environment is biting back at us in the sense that the environmental impact and societal impact started to show as a risk to the financial bottom line of the businesses that we finance and invest. So this is where um, the launch of the Principles for Responsible Investment happens in 2006. And prior to that, there was actually a legal report uh, called the Freshfields Report that was launched in 2005, which said that it was permissible to look at ESG issues, environmental and social governance issues, meaning non-financial issues um, for pension funds or others that have a fiduciary duty to honor. And um, because in the days before that, people thought that you could only look at financial issues uh, in your fiduciary duty. But because environmental and social issues had become increasingly important, like what we call materiality, uh, material uh, that we should start to look at it if we think they are material was the idea of the fresh fuels report and then that led to the launch of the PRI. So the PRI was looking at it um, kind of from an opposite lens to what the equator principles or the UN guiding principles on business human rights were doing which is looking at how businesses affect the environment you are now looking at PRI, which is saying that we should look at how environment is affecting the bottom line and the risk of financial institutions and its fiduciary duty. So we had this kind of, in a way, um, a sudden opening of sustainable finance into a completely new area. And this was more impactful because when you talk about the bottom line, people get more excited in finance. So um, it became much more of a serious issue and PRI is still very successful today as well. And I think then the next phase in sustainable finance is when Mark Carney as the governor at the time of Bank of England uh, did a famous speech called the tragedy of the horizon uh, at the Lloyds of London in 2015. This was the first time I think that a financial regulator started to look at climate change as a systemic risk to the financial system. And it's also really the, the, the big, um, I think, innovational revolution in sustainable finance was that we started to think about forward looking information to understand what we need to do today so for looking scenario analysis was you know and, and bringing science scientific information to look at forward-looking uh to to look at forward-looking kind of information and bring it back to what we need to do today and that is really quite revolutionary because a lot of the um, environmental, like ESG, environmental social governance information were based on today or yesterday's information, looking at the past, uh, following the, following how we actually do in like financial accounting, you know, everything is historical, it's not forward looking. And so that really um, was another big moment in sustainable finance where like the task force on climate related financial disclosures, TCFD started and we are looking at, you know, what is going to happen in 2050 if we stay uh, like this, you know, if we operate, continue to operate like this. And um, it's the, like forward looking information were being increasingly used um, in sustainable finance. And then I think the latest in terms of like mega trends is that that has like TCFD and that forward looking information started to then inform the risk. But then um, the next stage of sustainable finance was that actually, when you started to understand the risk, you really do understand that it is a systemic 
risk that Mark Carney was talking about and that you cannot really manage a climate change risk by just doing uh, divestments or trying to you know isolate yourself from the problem so the next big innovation was um, that we had to be part of the solution and that everyone has to be part of the solution and that financial institutions needed to bring down their own emissions which is not you know actually their scope one and two which is you know their operational emissions like how they use their electricity uh, and so forth but more about the emissions that are tied to their financial products and services and so that is when GFANS and other net zero financial sector alliances started to come up at COP26 in Glasgow in uh, 2021. And so that's where we are today. And we at GFANS, uh, we work with the nine net zero finance sector specific alliances. There are 675 or more institutions, financial institutions in 50 jurisdictions um, that are committed to bringing their own portfolios down to net zero by 2050. And it represents about 40% of the financial market, uh, financial assets around the world. Great, thanks Yuki. You mentioned COP26 there as a sort of key turning point for you or um, <clears throat> for the industry. We've just had COP28 in Dubai. Most of our listeners will be aware of the key agreements on moving away from fossil fuels and tripling renewable energy availability, mm. launching the new loss and damage fund. Um, from the outside, sustainable finance seemed key to almost every negotiation. What was, what was your experience? What were the most significant outcomes for GFANS? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of important things that happened at COP28, like, you know, what you said, like, and nature and agriculture and health and, you know, all these new areas um, that really have come in into the picture. I think from my perspective, because I work at APEC network of Chief Hands and we, um, our network, the objective of our network is to really bring the global discussions like global GFANS products to Asia and for Asia's own expertise and experiences and challenges to be brought up into the global discussions as well. So we, we call it GFANS to APEC, APEC to GFANS is like uh, what we try and do at, at the network. And so from the APEC network perspective, um, we put a lot of effort in trying to understand and define well understand and bring a come to a consensus on what is um credible and impactful financing when it comes to financing the the transition especially the transition of like brown economy and brown sectors and brown companies to to net zero or green as it was, so the, the brown to green transition. And compared to like green financing or like financing for climate solutions or financing for companies that are already green, um, people have various ideas of what good looks like in financing that brown to green transition. So there is less consensus and less clarity and, and there's more room for like greenwashing allegations and greenwashing risks for financiers. So there's a, still a little bit of confusion on what good looks like and also um, actual financing of the brown, brown to green um, is more difficult as well. Um, so we at APET Network have been doing a lot around that area and last year, we had launched a report on financing the, the managed phase out of coal fire power plants in APEX. So we, we were trying to come up with a set of recommendations on what good looks like when you are financing a 
early retirement or an accelerated retirement of coal-fired power plants. It's really tricky because you could, you know, financiers intentionally or unintentionally could be just greenwashing this whole thing. You know, they could say, I'm financing to retire a coal-fired power plant, but that is going to happen probably in 10 years' time, you know, or even longer. And so you could make that statement today, but it might not actually happen in 10 years' time. And so, you know, there is much more uncertainty. And so we, we came up with a set of recommendations for financial institutions to help them guide that kind of, you know, establishing what really is credible and what is impactful. Great. And just um, harking back to some of your comments earlier about the, your career to date, um, I was wondering if there is anything happening today in the field of sustainability that you predicted might happen 10 years ago. How's it changing? Right. Yeah, so as, as I was explaining earlier, sustainable finance really has kind of, you know, expanded, you know, kept on expanding its remit. I haven't really talked anything about like thematic expansion, but there's also been a lot of thematic expansion as well. Um, before, I mean, GFANS is very solely focused on the mitigation, climate mitigation area. But at UNEPFI, where I was before, um, we were working on the whole range of sustainable development and including like human rights and social issues as well, and how we can get financial institutions to mainstream these uh, issues into their financial decision making. So um, one of the things that, that myself and you know my, my colleagues at UNEPFI were working towards from fairly early on was how to you know it's really about the impact of financing um, at the end of the day so even though PRI started in 2006 and we UNEPFI was was uh, together with Global Compact the initiators of this initiative um, and that was looking more at how, you know, environment affects finance. We at UNEPFI's kind of main role or, or, or our mandate was more to, to kind of be the voice of the environment and say how finance is affecting the environment, both in a negative and, you know, possibly a positive way. And that we um, wanted finance to to have a better impact towards environment and society. So I guess we'd been working on that for a fairly long time, but it was quite hard to get that message across. And I, I guess Mark Carney, when he did that tragedy of the horizons, one of the last things he said was that, you know, while this was like climate change was a risk to the financial system, he was already indicating that actually uh, a smoother transition to a low carbon economy is required. So he was already indicating that finance had to, to play a role um, and the whole economy had to you know, move to a transition. Um, although, you know, at that time in 2015, a lot of his messages and what happened in TCFD was more about how does, you know, climate change affect me as a financial institution or me as a business and how can I prevent myself uh, from low, you know, from that risk. So it was very much kind of me, 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 but, but at the end of the day, I think what was predicted and what was going to happen was that we needed to really think about how financing is affecting the planet and society and how we need to make that better. So I think if I was to say, it's not really a prediction of 10 years ago, but that the direction that UNEP always wanted to have is actually realizing today. But I would say that that is as a result really of how bad the environment has degraded um, and how we are in such a pickle that, that, that has become a 
kind of a shared understanding amongst businesses as well today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you can see it happening in your own backyard, all of the extreme weather that we experienced in 2023, there's um, it really hits home, doesn't it? Yeah. It's not tomorrow, it's today, it's happening now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so knowing what you, you know now and the, the challenges that you do see ahead and that the industry is starting to see, um, what do you think governments and multinationals need to be prioritizing? How do you think the sustainable finance can uh, make a substantial difference in that, that future world that we're seeing arriving? Yeah. Yeah. So coming from the United Nations, you know, at the very beginning of the UN, um, the UN was only working with governments uh, on the understanding that governments were the ones that can solve all the social challenges in the world, you know, poverty, environment, and so forth. But by 2012, the Rio Plus 10, uh, Rio Plus 20 summit, the UN acknowledged that we need the private sector and the civil society to play a a big role in solving these challenges and that governments alone cannot do it. So there's been a shift, you know, of mindset between post-war period the UN and, and like in, in, the, in, in our century now. And I think today we really need governments and like MDBs, like World Bank, to be the catalyst um, of private finance and uh, businesses to create that positive impact to the economy and to really, you know, manage their negative impact that they create. So um, I think governments and, you know, World Bank can only do so much and the, the, the global challenges are so great that they need to be like the regulations need to be acting as um, as directional for private finance and, and commercial organizations to really be the, the solution makers. So in that sense, um, one of the key things that we're doing at, at GFANS is to have common understanding common definitions around what is the financing that is needed for the transition to net zero so that you know we don't have all these different and um, you know understandings that help uh, that doesn't help financial institutions that that especially finance across borders um to to get confused you know and and that different rules in different countries does not help so we are we are trying to support and doing a lot of uh, policy engagement around, you know, shared understanding of what kind of finance is needed, but also in order to actually do that financing, we need net zero transition planning. And so we are, we're a big advocate on um, the net zero transition planning and we work with the UK TPT, the transition plan task force of the UK, as well as other um, organizations that that do a lot of work on the transition plan uh, in getting the message across that it's really important, first of all, that you know every organization has a net zero transition plan, uh, both to direct their change management within their own institution, but also to inform each other and to inform you know regulators and their customers and their supply chain on what's going to happen how quickly and how you know how are their transition going to happen so that everyone can be informed of each other so those are the kind of um things that i think government can help you know in in providing direction on the country's energy transition and their net zero transition uh, that will support like roadmaps and you know pathways at the sector level that is science based. I think that is really important, and for yeah, and for World Bank and other MDBs to really uh, use their financing not to directly finance the 
net zero transition, but to support private finance to do that work for them where they can. So their role should be much more catalytic, you know, be a credit enhancement, be a guarantee and, um, and, and work on, you know, go, go on where we like the private finance find it really difficult to, to finance. Great. Thank you, Yuki. Um, I, we could keep uh, talking on this topic, but I think we'll, we'll leave it there. But thank you very much for joining us on this Britcham podcast and for your thoughtful comments on the field of sustainability in Asia Pacific. I'll particularly remember your comments on the, the need for the financial industry to be that catalyst to share best practice and, and move us forward towards that net zero goal. So thank you very much and thank you to our listeners for joining us and we will see you next time for another Britcham podcast. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the British Chamber of Commerce Singapore's podcast channel. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe and why not leave us a rating and review on Spotify, Apple, Google and the other podcast platforms. For more information about the Chamber, please visit our website at www.britcham.org.sg and tune in next time for a brand new episode.